Hey, motherfuckers, it's Mace Windu here, the most important guy in all of Star Wars. I almost killed that emperor you saw. Could have prevented the whole damn war. Well, it's about time this hoodie motherfucker reviewed Mace Windu. Been a long uh, time uh, since uh, he reviewed me. Star Wars. Uh, uh, Mr. Windu? Whoa, 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 what the oh, fuck are you doing oh, sneaking oh, up on oh, me? I'm sorry. Uh, I'll save oh, oh, your oh, 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 I'm sorry. Are you? I'm sorry, Mr. Windu. Uh, oh, Why is my I'm lightsaber sorry. blue? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Windu, but uh, Mr. 788 is reviewing Mace from G.I. Joe, not, uh, not, not Mace Windu from, from Star Wars. What? Motherfucker! Everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. We have a new patron. I need to give a code name to Alan O'Keefe. Alan told me he likes Beachhead and Frostbite. It's very difficult to combine those two things. But after much deliberation, I have decided Alan will be known as the Snow Ranger. Thank you for your support, Snow Ranger. It's much appreciated. Speaking of patrons, not long ago, I gave patrons the opportunity to vote for a review of Mace, an unsung figure from 1993. And they soundly rejected that opportunity. Mace was a loser. But hey, I'm a loser, baby, so why don't we review Mace? I'm also a little worried about how much time we're spending in the 80s this year. There's still plenty to review in the 90s, and if we don't get to it soon, the last few years of this project are gonna be a real drag. The 1990s was a mixed bag. We got a lot of really ugly G.I. Joe figures. We got a few really great ones. I try to point out the best of the 90s when I can. But today, we're not going to talk about the good or the bad. We're going to talk about a rarer animal, the mediocre 1990s figure. HCC 788 presents the guy who's so undercover, you probably forget that he exists. 1993's Mace. This is Mace, G.I. Joe's undercover operative from 1993. This figure was available in 1993 only. It was discontinued for 1994. This figure came very late in the G.I. Joe toy line. The line was ended in 1994. Mace was intended to be part of DEF, but it was issued in Battle Corps instead. DEF, which stands for Drug Elimination Force, was a subset of G.I. Joe figures issued in 1992. There was to be a 1993 DEF lineup, but it was cancelled and the figures were folded into Battle Corps. Mace is a Battle Corps figure. Battle Corps has a unique origin as told in Mark Balomo's Ultimate Guide to G.I. Joe 3rd Edition. Hasbro had a planned subset for G.I. Joe called Battle Scan, and the figures would have had an audio player in them that would play sound clips. But Battlescan was cancelled. The technology didn't work out. It may have been too expensive to produce. Most of the figures planned for Battlescan were issued without the audio technology, and the set was changed to Battle Core. Battle Core didn't have any special gimmick, other than the spring-loaded missile launchers, which had become pretty standard for G.I. Joe figures by the time. It was the core set of figures for 1993. Figures for other cancelled sets, like DEF, all also became Battle Corps figures. That's why the 1993 Battle Corps lineup was so huge. There were 38 carded figures. That's not including vehicles and vehicle drivers. As an undercover operative, Mace would be part of the intelligence wing of G.I. Joe. There were a few previous intelligence, counterintelligence, and undercover agents. These were the spies of the series. In 1982, Scarlet was the counterintelligence officer. She was the spy 
spy hunter. In 1984, the Baroness was in charge of Cobra intelligence. Also in 1984, Zartan was the master of disguise. His siblings would also fill that role. In 1985, Lady J was in charge of covert operations. And in 1987, Chuckles was the undercover agent. He had exactly the same job that Mace has in 1993. In 1989, Scoop was sort of a spy. It wasn't his specialty, but in the animated series, he started out as a Cobra agent spying on G.I. Joe. In 1993, we had new versions of Scarlet and Zartan. That was the same year that Mace was introduced. Espionage was not a big part of G.I. Joe, but there were a few spies in the line. I have the full card back for Mace, and that's a nice way to see how this figure was marketed at the time. We have some card art that is acceptable, but not exceptional. It's pretty typical of 1990s G.I. Joe card art, and a big step down from the classic card art of the 80s. Looks like this figure was $2.99 at Toys R Us. We have the G.I. Joe logo, then we have the Battlecore logo. I don't really consider Battlecore to be a sub-team. It's really just the main line of G.I. Joe figures for that year. Looks like he has his giant missile launcher on his shoulder, but it is not on his shoulder. We will talk about that later. The figures were numbered for some reason. Mace is number 29. Uh, behind where the figure was on the blister, uh, we have instructions for how to use the battle stand and the spring-loaded missile launcher. Flipping it around to the other side, we have the cross cell with the other figures that were available at the time. Uh, we have an advertisement for a couple of the other sub-teams. We have a flag point. Uh, then we have the file card, and we will take a closer look at the file card a little later in this video. Let's look at Mace's accessories. I have his helmet and missile launcher off. I will demonstrate those later. Let's look at the others first. Almost all of these accessories are reissues. There's very little new here, and most of the accessories came on a plastic tree like this. Kids would have to cut them off themselves. Only the helmet and the missile launcher did not come on the tree. And all of the accessories are this marigold color, except for the missile launcher. He came with more accessories than he can carry, which is a pet peeve of mine. He had rifle number one, which is a long bullpup style rifle. And this is a reissue of the rifle that originally came with 1990 Ambush, looking much better in black. He came with rifle number two, looking a bit more like a submachine gun. Uh, this is a reissue of the weapon that came with 1992 Shockwave version 2. Again, looking much better in black. This looks very similar to the submachine gun that originally came with 1988 Hit and Run. But side by side, you can see they are quite different. That is not a reuse of the same mold. Though it does look like they were trying to recreate the same weapon. The file card calls this an automatic street sweep of assault rifle. Uh, whatever, I think this is a Colt SMG. He had this oversized pistol looking thing, and this is a reissue of the weapon that came with 1990 Updraft. Uh, it is very similar to the pistol that came with 1985 Tomax and Zamot, but side by side, again, you can see it is not a reuse of that same mold. It is quite different. The file card calls this a rapid fire steel plated short rifle, which makes absolutely no sense at all. He came with a knife, a very small knife, in that yellowy marigold color. Uh, this is a reissue of the knife that came with 1991 Low Light. And don't all of these accessories look really great in black? Let's not forget the figure stand, always the best accessory on 90s figures, since 80s figures did not come with them. Mace had a helmet. I am not sure why an undercover operative needed a helmet, especially a very strange looking helmet like this. Uh, it will fit on his head, but it's a tight fit. 
Uh, it is hard plastic, so it doesn't give very much. It has one eye cut out, so you can kind of line it up and see his eyeball through there. And it has this very large tab on the right side. The strangest part of this helmet, the missile launcher attaches to it. That's right, you're supposed to put this tab in this slot on the bottom of the missile launcher, slide that in, and there you go. He now has a helmet-mounted missile launcher. Oh good, I'm glad that doesn't look stupid. That's right, he has a head-mounted missile launcher. It does not have a grip, it does not have an alternative way for him to hold it. Someone designed it, and another person approved it, and and nobody in the production process stopped it before it happened. Why does it fit into the helmet? I'm developing a hypothesis that all these 90s spring-fired missile launchers were made of styrofoam. That's the only way they could exist in universe. All of them are oversized for the figures, but the figures all hold them one-handed. This one supposedly fits on a helmet without breaking the guy's neck. Of course, if you attempted to launch a rocket from a styrofoam launcher, it would disintegrate. Which leads me to believe these missile launchers were for intimidation purposes only and never to be fired. The missile launcher itself uh, is black. It has a yellow trigger and some detail on it. The file card calls this a missile firing stealth gun with built-in silencer. Well, those certainly are words, other than missile firing, that does not remotely describe this object. The figure came with two yellow missiles, and I'll show you how to fire them now. Place the missile into the launcher barrel with the notch side up, press it all the way back until it clicks, uh, and let's test it out with our favorite target, Dr. Mindbender. Uh, just press down on the yellow trigger in the back to fire. Aim and fire. That's a really powerful spring in this one. And of course you have two shots in case you miss. Why does an undercover guy need this? Where is he going undercover that this would be appropriate? You know what accessory I want my undercover guy to have? A pistol with a holster. You can keep all this other stuff, with the exception of maybe the knife, and just give my guy a pistol and a holster. Let's take a look at Mace's articulation. He had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures well before 1993. He could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. Uh, he had a hinge at the elbow that allowed him to bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep that allowed him to swivel his arm all the way around. This was an o-ring figure meaning the figure was held together with a rubber o-ring that looped around the inside that allowed him to move at the torso a bit he could move his legs apart about so far he could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees and yes that knee joint is really tight on this one let's look at the sculpt design and color for mace and i can say he is made of all unique parts nothing is reused from earlier figures and that was unusual for 1993 on his head he has has blonde hair. His eyes and his eyebrows are in a light brown color, which is fine. At least they didn't give him blonde eyes. It's always weird when they do that. Some have commented on the odd shape and look of Mace's face, and yeah, it is an unusual face sculpt, but I can't say too much negative about it because he kind of looks like a guy I knew in high school. On his chest, he has a black jacket with a yellow undershirt. He has a yellow pistol in a yellow holster on a yellow strap with a yellow pouch. That is a harness that has uh, yellow painted straps that go around his back and over his shoulders. And then he has what looks like uh, some kind of communications microphone and a cord that runs inside his jacket. That's a nice detail, but he doesn't come with any other communications equipment. Maybe a communications backpack would have been appropriate. This color on the chest of the figure does pretty closely match the color on the accessories, so I'm sure that's why they went with this color for the accessories, but that is a very bright, kind of a loud color, and you know what other color would have gone great with this figure? Black. 
black accessories would have looked just fine. On his arms, he has black sleeves for his jacket and black gloves. There is no paint on the arms at all. The arms are very plain. On his waist piece, we have an extension of that black jacket over khaki trousers that covers his belt, so we don't get a detailed belt or anything like that. Waist piece is very plain. On his legs, we have those khaki trousers. Uh, on his right leg, we have black grenades with a black strap that goes around his thigh. We have an unpainted pocket on his left leg. Uh, the legs are otherwise pretty plain. Uh, there are some sculpted in seams on the trousers. That's not bad. It's a little touch of detail, but not very much. The legs of his khaki trousers cover most of his black boots. This figure, top to bottom, is remarkably plain. Plain is the best description I can give for this figure. It has sparse paint applications and few colors. Despite this, I like its understated quality. It's a nice contrast to a lot of what we got in the 90s. They could have done something else with this figure. Does Mace remind you of anyone? What about Chuckles? He has the same specialty, the same hair color, he fills the exact same role on the team. Take away all the weird accessories, give him a slightly different head sculpt, yeah, I admit that face doesn't look much like Chuckles, but Mace could have been Chuckles version 2, which we did not get in the Vintage line. As it happens, there was a planned Chuckles battle scan figure, but it was never released. We had a shot at Chuckles version 2, but we didn't get it. But just make Mace Chuckles version 2, it would have been a nice update. Let's take a look at Mace's file card. This is a 90s file card, so it's a little different from what we were used to in the 80s. Instead of a file folder shape, it is a rectangular file card with rounded corners. There is a copy of the artwork on the front of the card that has a list of the features on the figure, and I'm not going to go over those. I already talked about some of those when we looked at the accessories. Then we have a closer portrait of Mace here at the top. His codename is Mace. He is an undercover operative. His file name is Thomas S. Bowman. His primary military specialty is undercover surveillance. Secondary military specialty is intelligence. His birthplace is Denver, Colorado, and his grade is E8. It has a quote here, presumably from Mace himself. It says, I always have the last laugh on Cobra criminals right after I lock them up. That has to be one of the least interesting quotes on any file card. This paragraph says, After years of undercover work, gaining the trust of high-level criminals, Mace has managed to infiltrate some of the largest criminal syndicates in the world. While concealing his true identity, he leaks valuable information to his Battle Corps partners who use the information to raid crime warehouses and bust unsuspecting Cobra villains. Every day, Mace stays undercover. His life is in jeopardy, but to him, no risk is too great to continue the war against crime and to protect the innocent. From the Colorado Rockies to the shores of Tripoli, Mace is always ready to fight for what's right. This file card is super dull. It doesn't hold a candle to Chuckles' file card. It also also reads like it was adapted from an earlier DEF file card, like they wrote a DEF file card for Mace first, but when they discontinued DEF, they just changed it for Battlecore. This doesn't sound like a Larry Hama file card. I was hoping it would explain why he's called Mace. Is that a nickname? Taking a look at how Mace was used in G.I. Joe Media, well, that is brief. He had no appearances in the animated series, and he had no appearances in the comic book series to my knowledge. Looking at Mace overall, there's nothing outrageous about this figure. There's nothing glaringly bad, but it's a bit bland and boring. The head sculpt is a little weird. Despite that, maybe because of that, I really like this figure. It just feels right to me. It's not overdone in an era when they used to overdo everything. The accessories, Forget about the accessories. Other than the figure stand, I could lose all of them. This is a figure that needs a pistol and a holster. That's all he needs, and he didn't come with either. The character, like the figure, is a bit bland. His file card is less colorful than Chuckles, his most direct predecessor. I don't think this file card was written by Larry Hama. It reads like it was written by a marketing guy, not a creative guy. I can't give a figure a lot of credit for being plain, and not having a lot of paint apps, even if I personally like it. 
Can I save it from the bottom tier? I think so, but just barely. Mace's understated color scheme makes him stand out and rise above the majority of the figures from 1993. In the big neon pizza that was 1993, Mace is a little black olive, and that makes him special. The one thing that keeps me from moving the figure higher is the missed opportunity of not making this figure the second version of Chuckles. If this had been the second version of Chuckles, this would not be a forgotten figure. That was my review of Mace. I hope you enjoyed it. Hey, we gotta look at all of them, and they can't all be Snake Eyes. Next week is the five-year anniversary of the channel. I have a special review planned. It's something rare, so it fits with our theme this year. I invited viewers to send in video clips to be included in that anniversary video. The deadline for that has already passed. I'm sorry if you missed it. By the time you see this, I will already be putting that video together. Thanks for for five amazing years. Thanks for all the friendships and the fun and the support. Someday this project will end, but I hope many years after that I will still be calling a lot of you friends. For now, we still have a lot of G.I. Joe to review. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please consider doing so and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Please give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. I'll be back next week with a special G. G.I. Joe toy review, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Enough is enough! I have had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane!